This video cast is brought to you by the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, a part of the National Institutes of Health that supports research on basic life processes, leading to new ways to diagnose, treat, and prevent diseases. Dr. Sarah Tishkoff is a geneticist at the University of Pennsylvania. She studies genes from humans that have changed over time. She focuses her work in Africa, where humans have lived for the longest amount of time. And so by looking at people living there today, she can get the most complete record of how human genes have changed over time. Dr. Tishkoff, why is it important to study how the human genome has changed over time? Well, by studying variation in modern populations, we can make inferences about past demographic and evolutionary events. So if we want to learn something about when and where did modern humans evolve and learn more about the um, origins of different populations, or if we want to understand why some diseases are more common in certain populations than others, we can use evolutionary approaches to I try to identify uh, genetic variants that play a role in disease. Because in some cases, it's thought that um, genetic variants that cause some people to be at risk for disease in modern populations may have been adaptive in past populations. So for example, in hunter-gatherer populations that went through periods of fasting or famine, it may have been advantageous to have a genetic variant that enabled them to store fat or to have a um, very rapid um, increase in sugar in their blood. However, in modern populations, the same genetic variant could be maladaptive and result, for example, in diabetes. I know that one of your research projects focuses on the genetics behind why some adults can digest milk and others can't, and that you looked at more than 400 Africans in more than 40 different ethnic groups and discovered three genetic variations that allowed them to drink milk, to digest milk. Can you explain the significance of this issue and your findings? Sure. Well, humans are unique in their ability to digest milk as adults because in most mammals, um, the enzyme called lactase, which is expressed in the small intestine, is um, shut down after weaning, so in humans at around age two to six years old. And in individuals who can digest milk as adults, this enzyme is kept active, and it plays a role in um, metabolizing the sugar present in milk called lactose. So the majority of humans cannot digest milk, However, in populations whose ancestors have historically practiced dairying or domesticated cattle and are pastoralists, um, they have adapted the ability to digest milk as adults. So um, those individuals who can digest milk are referred to as lactose tolerant. And lactose tolerance is most common in northern European populations such as the Finnish population less common in uh, Mediterranean populations and very uncommon in East Asians, Amerindians, and West Africans. However, in East African pastoralists who have domesticated cattle, they have evolved the ability to digest milk as adults, and it appears that they have done so independently of Europeans. Can you tell me the role that computers play in your research? Sure, well, computers play a critical role because what we do is we study variation in modern populations and we have to make inferences about past events. And one of the ways that we do this is by computer simulation. So for example, we can simulate a scenario in which this adaptive mutation uh, that allowed people to digest milk as adults arose some number of years ago. And by looking at the pattern of variation in modern populations, we can try to use computer simulation to infer how old that mutation is, for example. And we can also infer how strong the selective force must have been to uh, make it reach the frequency that we observe it at in modern populations. We estimate the mutation, the most common mutation that we found in East Africa, to be roughly 3,000 to 7,000 years old. And we estimated the mutation in Europeans to be roughly seven to 9,000 years old. And that was interesting because archeological data suggests that the origins of pastoralism 
were either in North Africa or the Middle East, roughly seven to 9,000 years ago. But cattle were not introduced south of the Sahara due to arid conditions until roughly 5,000 years ago. And then they were introduced more recently into southern Ken Kenya and Tanzania around 3,000 years ago. So it fits strikingly well with our estimates for the age of this mutation. This mutation had to have occurred. And simultaneously or coincidentally in that population, they had developed a new technology which was domesticating cattle. Those individuals who by chance had that mutation were better able to digest milk as adults. And this gave them a selective advantage. They were able to have more children and their children had more children and so on. And so it rapidly rose in the population um, together with the practice of pastoralism. Dr. Tishkoff, I know that you have taken a number of trips to Africa over the past 10 years. Can you tell us about some of the adventures that you had in Africa? Sure. <laughs> we had many adventures. Um, when we first started doing this research, I had never done field work before, and I was not certain of things such as, where am I going to sleep? Um, how am I going to get to these remote villages? How am I going to process the blood to isolate the DNA in regions where there's no electricity. And we came up with creative ways to deal with this. So we brought all of our own equipment, we brought our own sleeping bags, we brought our own tents, or sometimes we stayed at guest houses and villages. We brought a portable centrifuge and we plugged that into the car battery. And so we could um, have our own little uh, genetics lab anywhere in Africa, no matter how remote the region. So one of the wonderful things of working in that region is interacting with the local people. And, and learning about these fascinating cultures and um, uh, different, working with different tribes such as the Maasai, for example. But it also can be, at times, somewhat uh, dangerous <laughs> depending on the region that you go to. But again, I think the key to success is involving local people in the research and having local participants. And as long as uh, the people that are um, that we are studying are included in the research, we've generally had no problems at all. Thank you, Dr. Tishkoff. Best wishes on your research and happy trails on your next trip to Africa.